of rest. Okay, so our first speaker of today's session is Johnny, who is going to talk about pressure one testing related to an immigration break. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me and thank you all for coming. Morning and uh, evening to people back online. Uh, this is joint work with Iskander Kalimulin, Joe Miller, and Maria Soskova. And let's see. Okay, great. So uh, uh, we need to talk about first what is enumeration reducibility. So I'll try to give an introduction in case you haven't seen this before. So for A and B subsets of omega, we say that A is enumeration reducible to B if there is a CE set W, which we think of as an enumeration operator, such that N lies in the set A if and only if there is some finite set D, such that the pair N comma D lies in W and D is a subset of B. So when I say N comma D lies in W, I mean that uh, N comma the some canonical code for D lies in W. So notice that this depends only on uh, positive information about B, right? The, the fact that D is a subset of B is enough to witness that this N lies in A. And so we're, unlike a Turing reduction, we are not using the fact that any number is not in B. We are only using the fact that some numbers are in B. And uh, so in a way, this reduction is transforming positive information from the Oracle into positive information uh, of the output. So we think Jun Le, we cannot hear you. Can someone restore the audio, please? We can't hear the speaker. All right, looks like somebody's taking some action now. We start with this one and and okay well i guess i'll i'll try to keep an eye on it make sure that it doesn't uh, run out okay so how about how about now okay so somebody said it works great so let's uh all right let's just continue great. from where where i stopped here so Okay, great. So, uh, yeah, we can also think of this in terms of enumerations, as the name suggests. And what, I'm, what I mean is that while well, we say that a function f on omega is an enumeration if uh, enumeration of the set A, if the range of f is equals to A, 
Okay, so so a set A will have uh, in general many enumerations, and we A is reducible to B uh, if if and only if every enumeration of B computes some enumeration of A. This is a theorem by uh, Selman. Uh, let me now give you some facts about enumeration reducibility, which uh, hopefully will give you some intuition about how it works. So uh, first, well, a set is CE, if and only if it is E reducible to the empty set. Okay, this is easy to see from the definition. Another fact, well, unlike in Turing reducibility, A and A complement need not be comparable under enumeration reducibility because we're only using positive information. So it's not obvious that from A, you can get A complement and vice versa. A is CE in B, if and only if A is enumeration reducible to the join of B and B complement. So if you take the join of B and B complement, then positive information from that uh, gives you complete information of the set B. So that's why we have this. And uh, analogously, well, A is computable in B, if and only if A join A complement is irreducible to B join B complement. Now that tells us that there is some relationship between the Turing degrees and what we call the E degrees. So we can define the E degrees in the same way that we define the Turing degrees for using this notion of reduction. And the Turing degrees embed into the E degrees by uh, what I just said. So send each set A to the join of A and A complement. And finally, here's an observation that we will use later. So if you have a gamma, which is an E operator, like in the previous slide, and uh, B is a subset of C, then gamma B is gonna be a subset of gamma C, okay? Because, well, the point is that if C is bigger, right, then every axiom that is valid as given by B is gonna be valid as uh, given by C as well, because you're just looking at whether some finite set is a subset of, its, of the thing, of the Oracle. So uh, that's a useful thing to keep in mind. All right, uh, I'll say a little bit about some motivation. So why do we want to study enumeration reducibility? Uh, one, and this was one of the original motivations, it is uh, an No salt. Test one. It works. Yes. Awesome. So. Well, sinon, on met la batterie d'ici là. On cherche une autre. Oh, sur mon autre cravate. Ouais. Comment ça y est? So, so now it's supposed to work. Merci. Okay. Perfect. Merci beaucoup. Okay. Does it work fine now? Just to confirm.
online people. <laughs> All right, thanks, Sebastian. Thanks, thanks for your patience. Oh, maybe not. Okay, how about now? Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. So I think we'll stick with this. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> All right, <laughs> thank you. All right. Okay, so yeah, some, some motivations for studying enumeration reducibility. So it's a natural way for modeling computation with partial functions. Uh, another thing, which was uh, kind of after the fact, so it forms a broader framework for measuring the relative complexity of mathematical objects. And this was, um, say, one, one example is Joe's work from 2004. And uh, another reason is that unlike the Turing degrees, the E degrees have several natural subclasses, which are definable using a natural first order formula. So I put some scare quotes there because, well, these are not mathematical notions, but the point is that, uh, well, based on work of Kalimulin, people have found several uh, first order definitions of classes which at first glance are not obviously first order definable. And furthermore, these definitions are you know, pretty short and they don't, re they don't rely on uh, say coding that is done in a Turing degrees, for example. And finally, uh, it is known that any non-trivial automorphism of the E degrees will induce a non-trivial automorphism of the Turing degrees. So this, uh, whether there is a non-trivial automorphism of the Turing degrees is a long-standing open problem. Uh, so, well, the E degrees might give us some perspective on that. Okay, so uh, I'd like to talk about some subclasses of the E degrees because, well, this talk is mostly about defining several subclasses of the E degrees, uh, that kind of, uh, it ties into the last motivation on the previous slide because we're hoping to find uh, more subclasses of the E degrees and then show that they are first order definable and uh, therefore restrict, uh, maybe possibly restrict uh, automorphisms that might appear. So uh, one class we've kind of already seen, so we can embed the Turing degrees into the E degrees. So that gives us the total degrees, uh, the image of that embedding. Uh, equivalently, a degree is total if you have a representative A such that A complement is uh, below A. Another subclass, which I'm not really defining here, uh, but roughly speaking, they are the degrees of continuous functions on uh, zero one. So this was uh, first studied by Joe and Joe showed that there are continuous degrees which are not uh, total. And uh, we also have the co-total degrees. So those are with uh, the degrees with a representative A, such that A is below A complement. And these uh, classes are related in the following way. So based on the results of uh, several authors, uh, the total degrees are properly contained in the continuous degrees, which are properly contained in the co-total degrees. And that is a proper subclass of all of the E degrees. So this is just kind of setting the stage. Uh, the reason why I've not defined uh, some of these precisely is because we're just going to use it for context. Uh, we're not going to really work with them here, no, at least not, not in the talk, certainly. All right, so coming now to the basic uh, methodology of our work here, the, the whole point is, okay, let's say we have a property that's true of all Turing degrees. Then what we can do is we can relativize it to talk about enumeration degrees in general, okay? And often how this is done is that, let's say the property involves something like CE in, uh, then we can replace that with E reducible two. And that, uh, that usually is going to agree with the original notion on total degrees, uh, but for general E degrees, well, it might, it might say something, uh, something new. Then what we can do is we can consider the subclass of all E degrees, which uh, satisfy this uh, relativized property. And with luck, it's gonna give us something uh, non-trivial. So uh, such a subclass is, well, it's gonna contain the total degrees and it usually strictly contains the total degrees. Our work involves uh, several such subclasses, which some of which are apparently new. And uh, the way we are, 
doing it is we are considering properties of pi zero one classes and relativizing them, and also the relation uh, PA above, which of course is closely related to pi zero one classes. Okay, so here's the first uh, main definition. So now I'd like to relativize the notion of a pi zero one class to use an enumeration oracle. This was first done by uh, Miller and Soskova in unpublished work. So uh, first let's define what a sigma zero one class relative to an enumeration oracle X. Okay, so we say that, uh, so capital X here is a subset of omega and a sigma zero one class relative to X is a union of cones where uh, each of the bases of the cones come from some set which is irreducible to X. Okay, so the analogy here is that in the regular Turing Oracle case, the, uh, this W would be CE in X, right? But now we've changed it to E reducible to X. Okay, so that defines a subset of uh, Cantor space, right? Which is open and uh, you know, effectively so in some way. Uh, and then we say, okay, a pi zero one class relative to X is one whose complement is a sigma zero one class relative to X. Uh, some some examples. Well, so if you have a pi zero one class relative to X in the Turing sense, then that is going to be a pi zero one class uh, relative to X join X complement in the enumeration sense. So essentially the same idea as what I said. Uh, if you have both X and X bar and you're looking at stuff which is irreducible to, to that, then that's the same as just uh, having total information about X. Another example which uh, comes up quite a bit is if you have uh, two sets A and B, okay, which are both irreducible to X, and uh, say they're disjoint, okay, so because if they, are, if they have intersection, then there are no separators, uh, but if they're disjoint, then they are separators, so sets that uh, contain A and are disjoint from B, and we can look at the set of all such uh, separators. That forms a pi zero one class, relative to X in the enumeration sense, okay? And so this, uh, this kind of class, we call it a separating pi zero one class relative to X. And here's a technicality, which uh, will help to kind of, um, later when I give more definitions, it's gonna, Turing functionals are gonna appear. And you're going to wonder why I'm using Turing functionals instead of enumeration uh, operators. And the point here is that elements of a pi zero one class relative to X, uh, we don't view them as uh, enumeration oracles. The, we view them as total objects. Uh, basically, well, in the Turing case, right? If you have uh, the set of initial segments of a path, right? That's equivalent to the sort of the real that's defined by the path, right? In the Turing case. Uh, but in the enumeration case, that's no longer true. So well, what we're doing is we're going to look at the uh, set of uh, initial segments, and that's going to be a total object. And so we can get both positive and negative information uh, from it. Okay, so now what can we do with this? What kind of properties are we going to look at? Uh, here's the primary notion that I'll be discussing in this talk. So we know that in the Turing case, uh, relative to every oracle, we have a universal class, right? The, namely uh, DNC, for example. So now we're gonna look at the, uh, the analog of this notion. So let's say uh, P of X is a non-empty pi zero one class relative to X in the enumeration sense. Then we say that it is a universal class for X. If for every non-empty pi zero one class QX, there is some Turing functional phi, which uh, computes given any element of P is gonna compute some element of Q. And as I just said, right, if X is total, then X does have a universal class uh, as given by the DNC functions uh, relative to X, uh, DNC two. And uh, furthermore, uh, more is true. So Ganchev, Kalimulin, Miller, and Soskova showed that every continuous degree has a universal class. 
So remember from the uh, slide previously that the continuous degrees uh, properly contain the total degrees, right? So this is a generalization of uh, the obvious observation. So now this raises the a natural question, right? Are there other degrees which have a universal class? You know, what which degrees have a universal class and uh, which don't? Maybe it's exactly the continuous degrees. Maybe it's all e degrees. Uh, there's a there's some question here. Okay, so it turns out that uh, it's not just the continuous degrees that have a universal class. In fact, uh, there are several different ways in which an E degree can have a universal class, and those ways are incomparable. Okay, so one of the ways is uh, what we call low for PA. So here's a, uh, a recall from the Turing case that we say that B, a subset of, the, of omega, has PA degree if B computes a member of every non-empty pi zero one class. So this is a completely classical definition. And now we say that X is low for PA if any, whenever B has PA degree, then B is already enough to compute a member of every non-empty pi zero one class relative to X. Okay, so that means that like, uh, well, even though X may not be uh, CE or computable, right? The, the pi zero one X classes always have uh, simple members, right? They can be computed by uh, any PA degree, just PA relative to zero. Okay, so, so that's uh, low for PA and we characterized uh, this notion by showing that, well, actually it's, uh, it's not only the case. So if X happens to be low for PA, is actually low for PA for uh, a reason, namely that actually every non-empty pi zero one X class has to contain a non-empty pi zero one class. Okay, so this trivially, like the backward direction of this equivalence is trivial because, well, if, if you have a non-empty pi zero one X class and inside of it, you can find a pi zero one class, well, then uh, if B has PA degree, then B computes a member of the pi zero one class and therefore a member of the pi zero one X class, right? So the backwards direction is trivial, uh, forwards direction is the content of this equivalence. And this uh, characterization from this, we can easily prove the following. So first, uh, if X is low for PA, then it does have a universal class. In fact, just take DNC two with no Oracle, that's a universal class for X. Also, uh, we can show that uh, there are lots of these low for PA things. Okay, one generics are low for PA. So in terms of category, there are a lot of these guys. And I promise that this was a different reason from before, right? So how do low for PAs relate to continuous? Well, actually these are uh, pretty much mutually exclusive. So this was first showed by uh, Miller and Soskova. If X is low for PA, then X is not continuous, except in the trivial case where X is CE. So notice that if X is CE, then it's obviously low for PA, right? Uh, but apart from that, right, then it, it cannot be uh, continuous. So this is a genuinely uh, different way in which degrees can have a universal class. Okay, now there's yet another reason uh, why degrees can have a universal class, and that is the uh, reduction property. So this is uh, well motivated by the reduction property from descriptive set theory. We say that a subset of omega x has the reduction property if whenever you have a and b, which are irreducible to x, then you can find uh, essentially, you can reduce them to A0 and B0. So A0 has to be a subset of A, B0 is a subset of B, A0 and B0 are disjoint, and their union is the original thing. So I guess if you haven't uh, seen this before, I guess a picture would help. So it's like we have uh, A here and B here. And then 
there's this like squiggly line in the middle and then this the thing with the squiggly line together with this the whole left hand side is a0 and the whole left right hand side is b0 hmm. okay all right so uh, this here in descriptive set theory we talk about uh, classes of rails having the reduction property so this here is the same definition but we look at the principal enumeration ideal uh, topped by x yes, so that's what this is and uh, if x is total then it's easy to see that it has the reduction property so this is like a first exercise in a recursion theory class right because if x is total then you're just looking at a and b which are ce and x and so if you have a and b which are ce and x then you just do a, some kind of uh, stage argument right you see which side it shows up in first then you can define your a0 and b0 in that way and well as, as i suggest right uh, so the reduction property implies having a universal class right so that's what we show in our paper and uh, furthermore this is again a different reason uh, to have a universal class okay so this was first uh, this property was first studied by Kalimulin and Puzrenko in this uh, enumeration context and uh, their results together with some other known results imply that uh, this property is incomparable with the previous two reasons for having a universal class so again uh, this is yet another way in which uh, some e degree can have a universal class And uh, now I come to the next primary notion that I wish to address in this talk. So this is a different kind of universality. Okay, previously we talked about having a universal class. Well, there's another notion. This was studied by Kalimulin and Puzarenko of having a universal function. Okay, so now we're not talking about uh, pi zero one classes. We are talking about partial functions uh, from omega to zero one let's say you can also think about partial functions from omega to omega these are uh, it gives an equivalent notion uh, let's read through this so x is a universal function if uh, there is a partial function u so u here is going to be the universal function uh, satisfying the following properties first uh, the graph of u has to be irreducible to x okay and secondly well, u has to capture every partial function whose graph is irreducible to x. Okay, so if you have some phi such that the graph of phi is irreducible to x, then phi is actually just a column of u. So the, uh, I think the obvious question here is, well, how do these notions relate to each other, right? Uh, are they related? And uh, this was at first a mystery to us, uh, but eventually, well, I'll say a bit about uh, this, but eventually we managed to show that they are related. So having a universal class implies having a universal function and the converse is false. And the, the way we prove the implication, okay, so the first sentence in the theorem is we give a characterization of having a universal function in terms of these separating classes. So remember when I talked about these pi zero one X classes, I gave an example of some kind of special pi zero one X class, which are these separating classes, right? These are the set of separators of some uh, two sets, which are irreducible to X. Now we show that X has a universal function if and only if we have a pi zero one X class P, which is universal for all of the separating classes. Okay, so this, what I write here, right, is exactly the same as having a universal class, except with the additional word separating. Okay, so instead of being universal for all pi zero one X classes, we are just universal for the separating ones. Okay, so in this way, right, it makes it trivial that, I mean, once you have the characterization, then it's trivial that having a universal class implies having a universal function. Because uh, having a universal class means that you're universal for all of the classes and uh, having a universal function means you're just caring about the separating classes. 
And uh, this, this turns out to be kind of a, an, an organizing principle, which I'll say a bit about at the end of the talk. Uh, but for now, for the next uh, few slides, I'd like to dive into the proof of the separation. Okay, in other words, the second sentence in the theorem. What we want to do is we want to construct some oracle which has a universal function but has no uh, universal class. Okay. Mm. Okay. So uh, we're going to use the following forcing notion to construct this uh, oracle. Uh, first, we're gonna, it's going to be a tree forcing, okay? and uh, we're not going to work with uh, binary trees. We're going to work with these trees, which are kind of exponentially uh, branching, kind of. Okay, so this, this f to the less than omega at the top here, right? we're just saying, okay, look at the sigmas such that at the nth level, the string has uh, 2 to the n extensions, okay? or maybe 2 to the n uh, plus 1 or something like that. And then a condition is going to be a pair consisting of a finite tree in this uh, f to the less than omega, where all of the leaves have the same height. Epsilon is going to be a rational number in 0, 1. So the meaning of epsilon here is going to be clear when we look at the uh, definition of extension. Uh, but let me just say first that, well, what it's saying is that Epsilon is telling us uh, that the tree needs to have at least one minus epsilon of branching. Okay, so it's I, I think it's kind of like a bushy tree thing, but you know maybe not exactly. All right, so extension now. So we say that s comma delta extends uh, t comma epsilon if the following is true. So first, s cannot add any short strings. Okay, so these, these uh, S is like an N extension of T. Okay, we are not adding any strings below the height of T. Second, every sigma in S, which is between the height of T and the height of S, needs to have many extensions. Okay, so let me try to draw a picture here. Uh, let's see. So, yeah, I guess I'll use this board here. Maybe this board, there is a chance that the online people can see what's going on. So what we have here is, let's say this is our T and we're saying that, okay, each of these guys, right? They need to have a lot of extensions all the way up to the uh, height of S. So this, this thing here is uh, S here. Okay, so we're not going to have any uh, dead ends okay, from here. Uh, and each of them must have, uh, in terms of proportion, they must have at least one minus epsilon of the available extensions. And uh, also this delta, well, so uh, we, as, as we extend the condition, we might want to uh, decrease the epsilon. So, so we might decrease epsilon to delta. Uh, and notice that, well, so what happens when we decrease that, that means that we are saying, okay, in the future, we need to have more extension, right? Because we are, doing, we are taking one minus of the epsilon. So as epsilon gets smaller, one minus epsilon gets bigger. So we have uh, more successes. Okay, so, well, uh, how does the generic look like? Well, as, as you expect, right, this is going to be an infinite subtree of this f to the less than omega and uh, it also has it has no leaves right because every time you extend well you're gonna uh, you have to keep adding extensions right all the time okay so uh now well, what does this have to do with the thing we're constructing so actually the thing we're constructing is going to be the complement of this generic tree. Okay, we're only looking at the strings in the complement. And why do we do that? Well, the point now is that if you look at the pi zero one class G, like the set of paths through G, okay, that's gonna be a pi zero one class relative to this A of G. 
right? Just in the in the obvious way, namely by the identity operator. And uh, let me say here that previously I've only talked about subclasses of uh, like two to the omega, but over here we can do f to the omega just because f is computably branching, so uh, we don't have to worry about that. And uh, just for later purposes, when we do the kind of the diagonalization, we'll have to do things like this. So what we'll do in the future is we'll take some sigma in the tree and we'll decide that we're going to remove every extension of sigma and, and sigma itself. Okay, so I'm just setting up some notation and some observations here for later. So uh, G backslash uh, sigma with this thing here is just G, but you remove all of the extensions of sigma, including sigma itself. Now, what happens when you make this removal? How does that affect the A sub G? How does that affect the pi zero one classes relative to A sub G? Let's uh, look at that. So, okay. All right, so here's the, here's the computation. Okay, so obviously, once you remove the stuff, the extensions of sigma, you get some subset of G. Okay, now if you take the complement, so then the, the inclusion flips, right? So the complement is going to be a superset of the complement you had previously. And that means that if you now apply any E operator, gamma, to the complement, well, then after the removal of the extensions of sigma, the complement becomes bigger. But remember that the in a pi zero one x class, the e operator is producing the uh, the complement of the pi zero one class, right? So if the complement is bigger, that means the pi zero one class is smaller. So that's the line on the bottom of the slide, where if we remove all the extensions of sigma, then the resulting pi zero one class is going to be smaller than the original one. Okay, so this is this observation will be uh, very relevant later when we do the uh, diagonalization. Um, okay. Uh, but before that, so here's a combinatorial lemma about this forcing notion. Okay, so this is there's no computability here. This is purely combinatorial. Uh, say we have a condition t, uh, comma epsilon over two. Okay. And let's say that we have two extensions, S0 and S1, and uh, delta 0 and delta 1, uh, but the deltas don't actually matter for this. Uh, the point now is that we can take the intersection of S0 and S1, and here I mean literally the, the set theoretic intersection of these two trees. Uh, and that's going to be a condition. Okay? By, the, by the properties of our forcing, that's going to be a condition. And furthermore, it's going to be a condition which extends T epsilon. Okay, so this, the idea here is that by kind of decreasing the epsilon, uh, we can kind of amalgamate like finally many uh, outcomes in some, oh, in some sense. Okay, that's, that's quite vague, but uh, we'll see what I mean here. So this, this combinatorial lemma here allows us to prove this uh, computability theoretic result. So uh, remember, we're thinking of the enumeration oracle A of G, right? That's the complement of the generic tree. Now say we have a graph of a partial function. So G phi, suppose that's E reducible to A sub G, okay? Now, because this is a partial function, so uh, we can look at the set of all N such that phi of N is zero, and we could look at, look at a set of all n such that phi of n is one, these have to be disjoint because it's a function. And furthermore, these two sets are irreducible to a sub g. Now the lemma here says that these two sets, well, they are separated by a pair of disjoint CE sets. Okay, and, and here I've, I've highlighted CE because, well, so notice here that uh, it's CE relative to no oracle at all. Right, so we get this uh, kind of uh, compression. And here's a sketch of the proof. So suppose that uh, gamma zero and gamma one are E operators, which uh, compute these sets from A sub G. Okay, these, are, these sets are irreducible to A sub G, so we can fix E operators that do the computation. 
And then we can fix a condition that forces that these guys are disjoint. Okay. Now look at T prime epsilon prime. Okay. And the point here is epsilon prime is less than or equal to epsilon over two. Okay. So we've decreased the epsilon by at least a factor of half. And now we can say, well, look at all of the extensions of T prime epsilon prime. Okay, as long as there is an extension of T prime epsilon prime that puts N in to the set, then we're going to put it into this CI. Okay, and the point here is that this CI is going to be CE, right? If you look at the definition, well, we're not, we're not using any uh, oracles here, right? This is just a CE thing. The conditions are finite, so you can quantify over them in a, in a CE way. So these guys are going to be disjoint CE sets, and you can show that uh, they must uh, separate the two original sets. Okay, so that was kind of the uh, hand-waving proof of this. But the, the, the key point here is that this, uh, the proof of this, the verification that these uh, CI separate the two sets, that relies on the combinatorial lemma at the top. Okay, this allows us to show that AG has a universal function. Okay, and the proof is as follows. Well, how do we construct a universal function? Let's uh, define it as follows. So uh, this capital U, right, has two components. The first component is like an index. Second component is like the actual input of the function. So uh, U E I X is equals to Y if two things are true. One is that, well, X, Y is in the, uh, set produced by the Eve enumeration operator. Right, so if you want if you want this Eve column to be like uh, uh, it has to if you wanted to copy the gamma e e function, then well it, that's what we're doing, right? We're copying it. Now the issue is that well, why don't we just do point number one and call it a day, right? What's the issue with that? Well, uh, the thing is that if you take gamma e of a of g well a lot of these uh, are not going to be functions okay they're going to assign uh, multiple outputs for in certain inputs right so we have to kind of be more conservative we can't just let everything in okay and that's what the second condition is about uh, essentially we're going to use dnc2 uh, to let things in and we don't have access to dnc2 uh, but using compactness, we can essentially get it. Uh, so I'll, I'll say in the rest of the slide how this works. But uh, just notice that condition two doesn't depend on a sub g. So that's a purely uh, CE thing. So this u here, it's a partial function. And also the graph of u is irreducible to a sub g. Okay, so let's, let's check that this works. Okay, so we claim that for any... Uh, g sub phi, which is irreducible to a sub g, uh, it's going to appear somewhere in this universal function. Well, suppose that g sub phi is gamma e of a sub g, then uh, there is some i such that if i is a dnc2 function, then phi i x is going to give a separator for these two uh, the sets, n where phi n is 0 and n where phi n is 1. Right? Why is that? Well, by the previous lemma, we know that these two sets are separated by CE sets. And DNC2 can compute in a uniform way separators for CE sets. So we know that such I must exist. And once you have such I, well, then you can check that, uh, in fact, phi must be uh, in this, the EI column of U. Uh, that's a compactness argument to show that, you know, all of the values of phi are let in by the uh, DNC2. Okay, <laughs> so kind of running low on time here. So I think I might skip the technical part here, but let me just say, okay, I'll state the theorem here. So the point is that uh, what we just showed is that AG has a universal function. In order to complete the proof of the theorem, we need to show that AG has no universal class. Right? And this is the statement, which is just a negation of the definition. And I'll wave my hands about how the proof works. The main idea here is, well, 
let's think about what you would naively do if you were to construct directly an oracle with no universal class. Well, you need to construct this Q, right? This non empty pi zero one class Q. And uh, you might say, well, uh, you want to you want to make it so that phi of x is not in Q, right? So you want to make Q small. The issue is that by by making Q small, you have to put stuff into G, and that causes you to make P small as well. I mean, it might cause you to make P small. And if P is small, well, then it's harder for us to find some X in P. So there is this basic uh, tension here, right? If we try to make Q smaller, then we might make P smaller too, which in turn makes a different part of our job harder. So, so there is this kind of basic tension here. And how do we resolve this? Well, the idea is that we decouple the two by saying that, okay, Q is going to be in some cone of G. And we are going to choose this X kind of outside of this cone, right? So what I mean precisely is that we're gonna take G and remove all of the extensions of Sigma. And we're gonna ensure that that, so even if we remove all of the extensions of Sigma, we ensure that the P is still going to be non-empty. So, so it, maybe it gets smaller, but it's not empty, so we can still work with it. That's the kind of the main idea. And of course, I have no time to give the details. So let me just uh, skip through here. Okay. So uh, here is a, uh, well, it's a picture of various results that we, that we did prove, and many of which I didn't mention. So the classes in both are the ones that we uh, defined in our paper. Okay. The other classes were uh, already studied before by other people. And uh, the arrows indicate inclusion, and we show that no other inclusions hold amongst these classes. Furthermore, uh, there is this organizing principle that I mentioned about the separating classes. So for each of the boxes, the three boxes on the screen, the, the class in bold is defined by quantifying over all pi zero one classes. Whereas the other class in the box uh, can be characterized by quantifying over only the separating classes. Okay, so I, I said it explicitly for the universal function and universal class, uh, but the same is true for the other two boxes as well. I guess, well, the, the box at the top actually is kind of by definition, it's not a characterization, but at least on the box on the bottom left, it's a, a characterization that we proved. Okay, last slide here. A uh, couple of open questions that I wanna mention. So the, the coming back to these, uh, you know, definable subclasses. So a natural question is, well, are these subclasses that we define, are they first order definable? So are they definable using just the enumeration reduction uh, relation? And uh, some of them are already known to be first order definable, uh, but most of them are, the status is unknown. Uh, second question is regarding something that I intentionally uh, <laughs> elided when I gave the definition. So this definition that I gave, which I'm repeating here, it has uh, some uniformity. I'm saying that for every Q, there is some phi such that for this phi is going to work for every A in P, right? For every A in P, phi of A is gonna be in Q. But I could have said something weaker, which is that uh, instead of saying that there is a phi, well, I just say for every A, there is a phi. Right, instead of saying there is a fee for every A, right? So, so there is some uniformity here that is more than what you might expect. And uh, we don't know whether this gives a separate notion. Okay, so we, we don't know whether we can separate these notions and how that affects the diagram. Uh, we're still not sure yet. Okay, uh, thanks for your attention. And uh, thanks for bearing with the technical difficulties. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Is there any questions? Yes. No, sorry, I have a very uh, stupid and question for general general consequences of your work, or maybe not your work, but all the work in this direction. So uh, we know that for a computable oracle, we more or less have the the, the entire theory of computability 
intact. And if we consider a numeration oracle or some intermediate notion like continuous degree oracle or something uh, in, in between, can you can just give a kind of general picture or take home message what part of the computability theory remains uh, and what not? For example, the notion of Martin Lefrandomness. What is the most general uh, oracle for which all the theory according to complexity characterization or, the, or uh, this uh, different equivalences definition tests for which in what extent everything's happen to be intact. Okay, uh, so yeah, I must admit that I'm not qualified to answer this question in full. In fact, uh, this project was motivated by uh, Joe and Maria's investigation into randomness relative to an enumeration oracle. <laughs> so, so that's something that uh, we did not, well, at least I did not explore in detail. So, so I don't have details about that. But uh, kind of the other answer is that, you know, it's speaking more generally about computability. Well, um, that's, it's only just a beginning. So, right, I, I, you see some examples here about properties that uh, fail for E degrees in general, but they are true for some E degrees, right? So, but for example, you yeah. have the arithmetical theorem mm -hmm. or the notion of analytical set or whatever. Mm -hmm. if, if we consider enumeration or it, the theory remains intact or, or becomes completely different. Ah, so that's a separate project we're also working on, <laughs> and okay, and the, no, the no, so no, that that is work in progress. So we actually don't know yet. Yeah. So so we are we are working on some details, and I think some people have looked at this in the past, right? Uh, but uh, honestly, yeah, I don't I don't have a, you know, maybe in a future conference I have a good answer for this. Yeah, but it's something that we're working on. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the question. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I don't have a good answer. Okay, any other question? Yes. So your your last question looks very much like the distinction between Medvedev and Mushnik degrees, because to some extent you are looking at mass problems after all, right? So what I mean, I'm I'm sort of seeing a connection, but I'm not sure whether that's correct or is misleading me. Well, okay, so I don't think anyone has looked at uh, Medvedev and Munchenich degrees, but but with enumeration reducibility, right? So I think that's a key difference here. Uh, so I don't, yeah, like I don't think any of the results that are known for those uh, reductions can be just applied here to give the answer. Yeah, things things are a bit different. So yeah. So you mean that just just enumeration reducibility? Is a, a special case of which of Medvedev degrees. Yeah. No, I'm not saying that because I'm not sure. I was asked. Yeah, no, no. I think I think the, the comment was that well, we're talking about computing members of some set, right? And we don't care which member we compute, right? We just want to compute. I, I just wanted to add a comment. There is something called the dement lattice, which which we're, we're, we know about, we've heard of, but we don't really know how it works. But that, that uh, incorporates enumeration reducibility. It, it looks at an, the analog of Medvedev and Mochnik, but with enumeration reducibility as a basis. Dement, dement, D-Y-M-E-N-T. Oh, oh, Paul will tell us, Paul knows. I have no more time. Okay, any any last question? So if not, let's thank the speaker again.